here's the thing, right? If you're going to go through the motion of creating a new GPO, I mean, the very first thing that I would, you know, have you guys do is to read the explain text of the policy setting. I mean, it seems like a simple thing, something really simple, but most people don't do that, and then they wonder why the setting that they set didn't actually take hold. So first things first, you know, read. Next, then you're going to try to actually roll it out. Now, before you roll it out, you're going to have to decide where you're going to do your test roll. Now, if you've got any ability at all, I would highly suggest you use an offline domain. Now, an offline domain doesn't have to be something fancy like it needed to be, you know, 10 years ago, which was like similar hardware uh, in a closed room with a lab manager. Hey, you could use like a, you know, virtual machine technology to make your own offline domain. I mean, group policy on a, on a Windows XP or Windows Vista or Windows 7 machine is going to act the same pretty much in a VM as it is going to be on a real machine. By and large, there are going to be some exceptions. So if, if I could give you one piece of advice, it would be to try everything first in an offline domain. If you can't do that for whatever reason, then, you know, if it's not a best practice, but it's an okay practice, is to use, like, an unrelated OU, so to kind of carve out some kind of section of the world and maybe use that as your kind of go-to place to kind of test out before you roll into production. Now, the downside, the only caution, is that, again, all the GPOs only live in one place, and that place, I like to call it the group policy object swimming pool, which is the group policy object node. The fear is that if you're kind of like halfway through a GPO, and somebody then, you know, links that GPO to some location that they're using, well, you know, that could be a problem. There's no way to segment who can use what GPOs in the swimming pool, even if you're just kind of practicing with them in, you know, at, at that stage. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. It does make sense. Um, the the the, the part that I was just mentioning earlier about the the, the rollbacks help uh, reactively in case something like that happens where the testing didn't uh, occur or wasn't tested well enough. But the other thing that I just wanted to show real quickly um, is, if I go back to the, the test drive here, um, is um, is this GPO modeling tab. Now, if you if you look at this GPO modeling tab, first and foremost, you're going to look at it and go, um, Nick, that's the same thing in GPMC. I already have this. I'm not going to pay for this. I already get it for free. Um, there's one specific checkbox on this uh, on this uh, page here that it makes this well worthwhile within the context of what Jeremy's talking about, and that is down here towards the bottom. It says use the offline GPO. Uh, actually, actually, I covered it myself to calculate GPO modeling. Basically, do RSOP, and I can take any GPO that's offline and include it as if it was real and online, and do my modeling and figure out what's going to happen. See, with, with you know, the native group policy tools, you can always answer the question, what if I move a user? What if I move a computer? What if I change security memberships and so on? But the one question you can't actually answer in the native RSOP, the native GPO modeling is, what if I make a change to a group policy? And if you think about it, that's what you're normally doing. You're making changes to group policies that are nested and so on, and you're trying to figure out what will happen if I make those changes. So we're giving you that capability. And then again, remember with the history, I always have the ability to roll something back should something negative happen as well. 